Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Evan said, my name is Gabrielle Goldberg, and I'm a rising fourth year PhD student in the biomedical sciences program here at UCSD. My parents are Latin American immigrants, and I'm the first in my family to go to college. But my story is not unique. About one in four college students is a first generation student. What is unique, however, and what I want to share with you today are my experiences and how they've molded my thinking of science and diversity within STEM. So the year is 2015. I'm in my junior year of college and I've just been rejected from the sixth summer research program I applied to. Without a program like this, I wouldn't have the research experience necessary to get into a good PhD program like we have here at UCSD. So I'm feeling pretty hopeless at this point. Naturally, what do I do? I'm home uh, with my mom for college and I ask her for some advice. She tells me in Spanish to ask the deck of tarot cards and to draw a card. You see, up to this point, the closest thing to science in my home are astrology and tarot cards. And if you don't know what those are, according to Wikipedia, astrology is a pseudoscience that claims to divine information about human affairs and terrestrial events by studying the movements and relative positions of celestial objects. So essentially, it's a more complex horoscope. And tarot card reading is the practice of using tarot cards to gain insight into the past, present, or future. So on top of these mystic beliefs in my home, my parents are also artists. And so while I'm applying for these summer research programs sitting in my living room, it looks a lot like this, except all of my parents' art are on the walls. If you don't know who this is, um, this is a picture of the late Walter Mercado a Puerto Rican astrologer that reached 120 million viewers in the US and Latin America every single day. There's actually a documentary about his life uh, that's coming out today on Netflix. It's called Mucho Mucho Amor, which is his sign off. I haven't seen it yet, but I definitely will. <laughs> so although my, although my mystic upbringings may be unique in the science academic community, it is a part of at least 120 million people's lives every day. Now I'm a visual person, so the number 120 million doesn't really speak to me. So here's a visual. In one day, the equivalent of the combined populations of California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Michigan would tune in to hear the horoscope readings by Walter Mercado. And if that doesn't shock you, the Super Bowl has about 20 million less viewers than Walter Mercado had in one day. So what does this mean? What am I trying to say here? This means that 120 million Hispanics tuned in to hear a member of their community preach something that the science community calls a pseudoscience. And that clash is where I believe anti-science bias started within my community. And to represent that clash, here's a piece done by my stepdad called El David y los Globos, which translates to the David and the Balloons. You see, my stepdad fled Cuba after the revolution so he could produce his art free from government censorship. He has a he has strong feelings against government and science control. And I think this piece does a good job of representing his feelings of government and science working together to destroy or censor art. So I, the way that I interpret it is that these men in these balloons represent the government and the scientists and they're nailing um, and destroying you know, art, which is depicted by the David. And while this may be my stepdad or one person's anti-government, anti-science view, in reality, he shares this view with many people. And so during a pandemic, like the one we're experiencing right now, 
We can clearly see the consequences that anti-science bias have on everyone. And it's clear that there's a communication barrier between us, the science community, and the general public. It's very frustrating when you tell someone that you're an expert in something and they don't listen to you. But what we need to realize is that we can't force the public to listen to us, especially when we, the experts, don't look like the public. So to fix this communication barrier and protect our species from not only global pandemics, but preventable diseases, climate change, other science-related problems, we need to do at least three things. We need to recruit and hire more diverse faculty body. That way our science experts look more like the public. See, my parents trust science more now that they see someone like me doing it. We need to share our human experiences. We need to emphasize that we are not science discovering robots. We are humans with unique experiences. And using a platform like this one, uh, we can do exactly that. We also need to build strong, trusting relationships with the public. So rather than lecturing the public with facts and papers, we need to have meaningful conversations through outreach. And so by doing this within my own community of mystic believers and COVID deniers, I was able to convince my parents to wear a mask that they had painted themselves. And that's a picture of them with their painted masks. <laughs> and on that day in 2015, when I asked the tarot card deck, about my last chance at a summer research program, I drew the chariot card. And this card signifies that with drive and motivation, you will have great success in your career. And the next day I got accepted to a summer research program at UCSF. These summer programs are crucial for URM and first gen students like myself. That summer showed me that someone like me can get those opportunities working in state-of-the-art universities, studying science that interests them. That summer was also my first time leaving my home city of Miami, living in California and studying neuroscience. And today I'm in the middle of my PhD studies in the most beautiful city in California, studying neuroscience. And I'm so grateful for that card. So now I'll talk to you about the work I've been doing for the past couple of years in the Motri lab, modeling neuroimmune interactions in Icardi Gutier syndrome. Icardi Gutier syndrome, or AGS, is a rare genetic disorder that affects the brain, immune system, and the skin. It is so rare that the exact incidence and prevalence is unknown. Patients with AGS show signs of systemic inflammation, like these Schoblain lesions that are seen also in lupus. And the systemic inflammation is also similar to what we see with congenital in infections. AGS patients also have severe brain abnormalities that include brain calcifications like these seen here and hypomyelination. Mutations in seven genes are associated with AGS, and all genes are involved in nucleic acid metabolism. The most severe form of AGS is caused by mutations in the T-Rex1 gene, and this accounts for about one-fourth of all mutations in AGS patients. Mutations in T-Rex1 are associated with an early onset of disease and a high number of deaths, about one third of patients with T-Rex1 mutations die before the age of five. And those who survive past five years are left with profound deficits in motor and communication activity. There is no cure for AGS. The current treatments target the inflammatory symptoms of AGS, such as with broad spectrum immunosuppression, other treatments currently in clinical trials include reverse transcriptase 
inhibitors, which attempt to prevent accumulation of self-DNA caused by TRX1 loss of function, and JAK1-2 inhibitors, which attempt to block interferon signaling downstream of DNA sensing. Although these treatments seem promising, no treatments have improved neurological symptoms. And a reason for this is that the neuropathological mechanisms are unknown due to mouse models that do not recapitulate those symptoms. And luckily in the Motri lab, we use human brain organoids derived from induced pluripotent stem cells to model neurodevelopmental diseases. These organoids are self-assembled spheres with internal cytoarchitecture similar to that of a human neocortex. They're also transcriptionally similar to a prenatal human brain. And so with regard to studying AGS, this model is ideal because it bypasses the deficits in the TRX1 knockout mouse model and allows us to study brain cell communications in a human model. Using this model, my lab has shown that TRX1 deficient brain organoids are smaller in size compared to an isogenic control. It's pretty prominent here in the later stages of development. And so we were wondering what cell type or what is dying in these cells. And when we looked at astrocytes derived from these stem cells, we found that TRX1 deficient astrocytes release interferon alpha, the hallmark inflammatory cytokine of AGS. The release of interferon alpha caused more neuronal death in normal control neurons. And that can be seen here in this staining of CC3, which is a cell death marker and tunnel with this astrocyte condition media. We also saw that the interferon alpha caused variations in size within the brain organoids. And this is seen here with the astrocyte condition media on the brain organoids. And so from these results, we hypothesized that AGS affects many different cell types and has a strong immune component. We then decided to further investigate the development of glia within AGS brain organoids. And so what we did is we grew brain organoids and sectioned them at 100 days and stained for markers of these glia. And we found that AGS brain organoids had less GFAP positive astrocytes than control organoids at 100 days in culture. We also found that AGS brain organoids had more oligo 2 positive oligodendrocytes than control brain organoids. However, because the oligo 2 marker does not specify oligodendrocyte maturity, we can assume more oligodendrocytes means more myelinating cells. And so we need to further investigate the maturity of these cells. In addition to astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, we wanted to study microglia. Microglia are the resident phagocytes and immune cells of the brain. They're involved in several neurodevelopmental processes such as surveillance and neuroinflammation. And since AGS has such a great inflammatory response, we thought microglia would be affected in this disease. Microglia originate from a different cell lineage than neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes, so we need to generate them separately. And so to, to do this, I follow a protocol generated in my, in my lab by a very talented postdoc and mentor, Pinar Messi. And to generate these cells, we do a sequential change in a cocktail of factors seen here in this protocol uh, to stimulate the microglial differentiation and then we sort the suspended cells. And so after generating these cells, we observed severe viability impairments in AGS microglia compared to controls. Less than 20% of the sorted AGS microglia were alive. When we look at the surviving cells, as in this bright field image, we notice that AGS microglia had a more round amoeboid morphology as opposed to this more ramified morphology in the control cell 
and this is indicative of an inflammatory reactive microglial state. So because of this morphological difference, we wanted to study the function of these cells. And so we looked at the phagocytic function using a Frodo-Red conjugated zymosan assay. And what this assay does is it lights up the cells red when they engulf those conjugated particles. So all of these little red dots are microglial cells that have engulfed these particles. And so although there's a slight decrease in AGS microglial phagocytosis, the results are not significant. And we thought this was unusual given the fact that the viability and morphological phenotypes were so drastic in these cells. So we hypothesized that while the engulfment step of phagocytosis might not be effective, perhaps the digestive step is. And this digestive step relies partially on the lysosome and lysosomal biogenesis. And so upon closer inspection of the generated microglia, as seen in this blown up bright field image, we see enlarged cellular compartments in AGS as compared to control. This is interesting because this can be indicative of increased lysosomal biogenesis. And in diseased cases can result in impairments in lysosomal digestion of phagocytose particles. A regulator of lysosomal biogenesis is the transcription factor TFEB. And so we then decided to stain for TFEB to determine subcellular location. A nuclear location of TFEB would uh, indicate an increase in lysosomal biogenesis. And we, we saw slightly more nuclear TFEB in AGS microglia compared to control. And so given our preliminary data, we, hypo we hypothesize that in the absence of functional T-Rex1, mTOR, mTOR C1, which phosphorylates TFEB, is chronically inactive, promoting nuclear translocation of TFEB. This nuclear TFEB upregulates the transcription of lysosomal biogenesis genes and autophagy genes, and the upregulation of these genes correlates with expanded lysosomal compartments and a dysregulated specialized cellular function, such as phagocytosis myelination and exacerbated inflammation. And that these dysregulated functions of cells leads to impaired brain development in AGS. And so since I'm in the middle of my PhD, I plan to study this model by characterizing the mTOR C1 TFEB signaling axis in developing human glia, studying how the impact of TRX1 affects human glial function, and finally, attempting to understand the impact of TRX1 during human brain development with brain organoids. And I would study this by co-culturing the microglia with the brain organoid. And the nice thing about the co-cultured brain organoid model is that we see a more complex in vivo-like morphology as opposed to immature uh, morphology seen in our 2D culture. And all of these green cells are microglia here. We just have it in a 2D culture. And here we have it within the organoid. And so not only can we study the neuroimmune interactions, but also more mature functions of these brain cells. And hopefully by elucidating the neuropathology of AGS using our model, we will discover a new druggable target for treating this disease. And with that, I'd like to thank my lab. Um, special thanks to Panar, my most direct mentor, Charlene, my mentee, Fabio, Angela, Cedric, Allison, my mentor, I'm really lucky to have a mentor that values outreach and science communication. I also need to thank my funding sources as well as Abercams and SACNES. I wouldn't be here without the opportunity of presenting at those conferences as an undergraduate researcher.
And last, I'd like to thank the organizers of Dazzle um, and Jean Yo for giving us this platform to not only share our work, but also our experiences. And with that, I'll take any questions.